Hey, welcome back, Faithful Politics listeners and viewers. If you're watching on our YouTube channel, I am your political host, Will Wright, and I am joined by Pastor Josh Bertram. Yo, what's going on, Will? <laughs> that was a, that was a long uh, in the in the biz. They that call was that delayed, a, dude. They <laughs> they call that a pregnant pause. Uh, <laughs> ah, yes, it was quite pregnant. <laughs> yes, uh, but but this week we are actually talking with. Sheila Ray Gregoire. Um, she is the author of 11 books, including The Great Sex Rescue, the host of the Bear Marriage podcast, and the founder of To Love, Honor, and Vacuum. Um, this week, we're going to speak with her about her new book, She Deserves Better. Here it is, in the flesh. Uh, <laughs> Raising Girls to Resist Toxic Teachings on Sex. <laughs> Whoa, we've all got it. It's the, it's the, the book tri trio. Um, uh, <laughs> So raising Girls to Resist Toxic Teachings on Sex, Self, and Speaking Up. Boy, that's a tongue twister. Mm -hmm. so, so, so welcome to the show, Sheila. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yes, welcome. Yeah. So, you know, we we have so many questions. And um, the the first question that's not necessarily related to your book, it's more related to, um, like, the process of writing a book. Um, so you wrote this book with your daughter. I yes. Would. And, and it's really weird because you've also written other books like with your daughter, like the great sex rescue. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was just sitting when I was, as I was reading your book, I was just thinking to myself, like, what was that like? Because I mean, I, I would never want to talk about sex with my parents ever <laughs> that would be super under, awkward under any circumstance <laughs> but mm -hmm. like here you are writing a book about it so maybe you can t talk to us about like what were like like how did you teach your kids about the birds and the bees because that had to have been an interesting discussion oh i did it really badly i did it was just <laughs> awful I, I took i took rebecca away when she was 10 and we listened to the cd series um that talked about what sex and your period and all of this and um she came away from that thinking um, not understanding why men um, would have to scratch uh, down there because it was explained that the penis was like a finger. So she didn't understand how that worked. Um, wow, that's funny. Yeah. So I made, I made lots of mistakes. I made many mistakes with my younger daughter too, but the good thing is we could always still talk. And so even though I didn't do a great job when they were 11, it didn't matter. We had a good relationship and we could keep talking. And this whole thing got started for us. I I've been blogging about sex and marriage for years. Um, I started off as a mommy blogger. The more I talked about sex, the more my traffic grew. So I kind of became this Christian <laughs> sex space, which that no one happen, grows dude. up thinking, you know what I want to do when I grow up? I want to be the Christian sex lady because that is just yeah. weird, right? But I was doing this all through their teen years. And then when Rebecca graduated uh, from university, she was home. She was looking for work that she could do while she was pregnant. And um, I had been blogging and we had started to notice some scary things because I started to read some other evangelical books, which I had never done. I was afraid of plagiarizing. And when I did, I saw how badly these books talked about sex. And so we decided we would do huge research projects and actually study this because we thought, hey, let's take Jesus at his word. I know that's radical, but he said <laughs> that, you know, a bad tree can't bear good fruit and a good tree can't bear bad fruit. So let's measure the fruit of the stuff that we're teaching. And that became the great sex rescue. And now she deserves better. So there's three authors. Uh, Rebecca did most of the survey design because that's what she's trained in. She did our focus groups and she did a lot of the editing. Um, I did the writing and Joanna Sawatsky did the stats. So there were three of us for all for the for both books. That's amazing. And mm -hmm. that and, is amazing. And 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 I I I suppose you know writing writing the book um especially you know she deserves better it it implies that you know a a young christian girl you know may not you know maybe or or may have been taught wrong um, about certain things about sexuality and whatnot. So, so like, was, was the book more or less like a, you know, like an admission <laughs> or, or like, like a, you know, a personal intervention, um, that you can provide for your daughter. And, and if not, you know, maybe, maybe you can just kind of tell us what, like, what inspired you to write this book? 
So after we wrote The Great Sex Rescue, um, where we addressed some of the big teachings that are prominent in evangelicalism, that lower women's orgasm rates, lower arousal, lower libido, increased rates of sexual pain, lower rates of marital satisfaction. Um, if you go on Amazon right now and you read the reviews, there's like 2,200 of them or something. Over and over again, people are saying, I feel so validated. I feel seen. This is great. But then those same people came back to us and said, but now I have no idea what to do with my kids because I grew up with so much toxic teaching. I don't want to pass that on, but I also don't want to tell my 14 year old, go do whatever you want, like <laughs> spread your wild oats, right? Like we need, we need to figure out what is actually healthy. What is, what does following Jesus actually look like? And so we did another project, uh, 7,000 women this time to look at how their experiences in youth group, um, the teachings they heard growing up, the sex ed they heard, how that affects women long term in terms of, again, marital sexual satisfaction, the likelihood they'd marry an abuser, um, their long term self-esteem, et cetera. That's amazing. That's, so when you were doing all this work, were you shocked? By what you found or were you, were you, I mean, obviously you would have been validated if people were saying like, oh, this is exactly what I've experienced, but were you shocked when you started seeing all the things or did you basically predict that? The um, kind of results that you find. I didn't have a lot of surprises. Like we knew certain things were going to be harmful and they were. Um, I think what surprised me, especially with the most recent book was the size of the magnitude of the harm. Like, let me give you an example mm. of some of the worst, the modesty messages that we give to teen girls. So we measured four different iterations of them. Ideas like boys are visual in a way that girls will never understand. A boy can't help but lust if a girl is dressed like she's trying to incite it. Girls have a responsibility not to be stumbling blocks to their brothers by what they wear. Um, a girl who dresses immodestly is worse than a girl who doesn't. So we measured those. And when girls believe that as teenagers, they have a 68% higher chance of marrying an abuser. They have a 52% higher chance of experiencing sexual pain or vaginismus. And that's a sexual dysfunction disorder. We found an, um, an incidence rate of 23% among evangelical women, which is about two and a half times the rate of the general population. And it's long been known that this is largely an evangelical problem. And we've identified several key beliefs that contribute to it. And the modesty message is huge. So when we tell girls that boys can't help but lust after you, and you have a responsibility to keep boys from sinning, we do incredible harm to our girls. Wow. And so what is it like? All right. I, Cause I grew up in, I grew up in this, right? So I mm -hmm. was, uh, you know, pastor's kid. And then, um, I, when I was in youth group, my dad was in denominational leadership, so I wasn't at a church that my dad was pastoring, but I did, you know, I had the ministry, you know, experience and the expectation, certainly the purity culture, you know, going to conferences where guys would be like, well, you know, we were both virgins and then we came together and had sex and it was the most like magical evening in the world and everything. <laughs> You know, angels were singing and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, dang, dude. And basically, I decided very early that I was not a pure person. And that it didn't really matter what I did. Um, I, I just couldn't, I, I couldn't control my thought life or whatever it was. So I was like, I'm done. Um, that must be for someone else. Like this whole idea of like what purity means and all that stuff. Like, and, and I grew up in a Christian home. And I wonder like, when you've seen this negative correlation, negative impact on women, what, what do you imagine? Or maybe you've seen, what's the impact on boys? Do they, um, we, like, how is this, how does this connect between? I think there, there's several things that have happened. So we did a, we did a large survey of men too, for our book, The Good Guy's Guide to Great Sex, which came out last year. And one of the big issues we found is that men have largely been taught you are not capable of controlling yourself. So let me give you some examples. Every Man's Battle, huge book series, right? Sold 4 million copies. Oh, yeah. Okay. So that book series says, and I quote, uh, we find another reason for, for sexual sin among men. We got there naturally simply by being male. It also says men don't naturally have that Christian view of sex. And so the whole idea behind that book series is that 
male sexuality and the objectification of women are one and the same thing. And that men don't actually want intimacy. Men just want physical release. And when you teach that to guys, guess what happens? <laughs> like when it you just kind of, hey, makes sense. Yeah. When you teach guys, you are entitled to sex because you have sexual needs. Your wife is there to fulfill your sexual needs. You create men who um, are very unlikely to have a very good sex life because they're going to be chronically dissatisfied with their wives. And they're going mm. to have very poor marriages because they don't understand what intimacy is. So that's one problem is you create a sense of sexual mm. entitlement, which isn't healthy. It honestly isn't. And there's such a better way of looking no. at it. Um, the other issue is we cause a tremendous amount of shame and helplessness on young boys. So, you know, you're 12, 13 years old, you're starting to notice, hey, that girl has a chest. I like that chest. Yep. That is an attractive chest. And, and you think, oh my gosh, I am sinning. I am a big bag of disgusting grossness because I have just lusted. Totally. And we have conflated- With The second look, you can look once. <laughs> if you look twice, that's when you're getting sent to hell. But it's, it's conflating noticing with lusting. Like noticing is not a problem. Jesus never said whoever sees a beautiful woman or whoever notices that a woman has a nice figure has lusted after her. Right. Um, you know, Jesus said whoever looks with lust. So it's, it's a deliberate action paired with a deliberate mindset. And I think we have taught boys that they are sinning merely by existing. And we've created this. And so if that's true, if guys are sinning every time they notice a girl is beautiful, then they're helpless. And the only option is to cover up all the girls around them. And that mm. does a tremendous amount of harm to both boys and girls. That's great. Um, you know, I, I did hear somebody famous once say that, like, if you're famous, you can you can do all these things. You know, you can start kissing on them grab them by the whatever oh yes uh, <laughs> who, who yes I, I remember hearing that too <laughs> <laughs> and i'm wondering if maybe you know this individual is just just a victim of that sort of like uh i don't know that that the thing that you're just talking about how how they are raised because because for me like like so i wasn't i wasn't raised in a christian household um i was atheist better part of my life um, my wife is actually the one that that brought me to Christ, and my wife is a PK. Um, and it's actually her dad was someone that married us. And I remember, like a lot of the stuff that I I, I see in her book, I see reflected in my in my wife or, or early on in our marriage, um, because like I think my wife is smart. She's extremely beautiful. I call her hot. And mm -hmm. like and and early on, I used to be like, you know, like yeah, like you know, she's like feel free to to show a little you know, I don't know, shoulder or whatever. Cause she also grew up Mennonite as well. So, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. so, so I would, I would tell her, you know, yeah, feel free to dress, you know, a little bit more sexy because I like looking at you cause you're my wife, you know? And, and I remember her telling me that, you know, it's, it's, she, she was always raised to be very modest um, and to not, you know, tempt others. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I never really quite understood that. So from a person that, that didn't grow up in the church and hearing this from, you know, his, his thin wife or now wife, like, and some of them I'm extremely attracted to, like, it just, it just didn't seem, it didn't seem fitting. So mm -hmm. like, but, but now she's going through this process of kind of deconstruction. And, and, and my, my, my question to you, uh, cause I think it, it relates to my own wife is, you know, how much has your book contributed to, you know, women's, you know, deconstruction, especially as it pertains to kind of their place in the church and, you know, how they dress, how they look, you know, how they speak or if they can speak um, in front of the church. Yeah. What we look at in She Deserves Better is not only the purity culture messages about modesty, about consent, about how it's your fault if if he goes too far because you were supposed to stop him. You know, those messages that the that, that girls heard, but also the bigger questions of, yeah, like, do women take up too much space? Are women's voices a problem? Um, you know, is it okay for women to have boundaries and to say no to things? Um, these are questions that that we often struggle with because we're taught, you know, Jesus gave up everything for you. So how dare you want something for yourself? You need to be willing to give up everything for other people. And the idea of living a boundaryless life 
is very dangerous. It's not healthy. It's not even what Jesus did. Jesus walked away from the crowd so many times because he's like, nope, got to move on. Sorry. Um, and, and so understanding that God values you, he values your voice. He values your opinion. He put you here for a reason. That's a message that a lot of women didn't hear. Now, a lot of boys didn't hear it either, but even more women didn't hear it. Because we were taught things like girls talk too much and girls need to be silent. Um, we actually measured that belief. That's one of my favorites. So uh, that was told a lot in Focus on the Family's Brio magazine to girls that boys don't like girls who talk too much and girls talk too much. So you need to be quiet. So we asked women, hey, when you were teenagers, did you think that girls talk too much? Um, and most women did. And we asked them, hey, do you think girls talk too much now? When you believe as a teenager that girls talk too much, you're way more likely to marry an abuser. You have way lower self-esteem. And even when you are married, when you grow up and get married, if you both work outside the home, you are way more likely to do all the housework. Like it's incredible the things that are related to this. Because think about it. If you it's think crazy. that girls' words are a problem, that, then what you're saying is my thoughts and feelings and opinions are a problem. They don't matter as much as his. And if you believe that, you're likely to marry someone who agrees with you. That's crazy. Yeah, that's really crazy. Um, mm -hmm. you're, you're, it's like you're... that correlation. So, yeah, I mean, I was thinking because I was wondering and I was, I was trying to process like, okay, you hear these things like girls talk too much. Um, which is just surprising because some of the stuff like I'm I'm shocked by that these messages were given because I didn't see them personally growing mm -hmm. up. That doesn't mean much, um, but it's just so shocking to me because I felt like I'm I oh I know evangelical culture I grew up in it blah blah blah. But it's like there's so much of it I'm finding now that was even way way worse than my experience. Way worse than my experience. I had, I mean, I had a pretty mild experience, I think, in some ways, and part of that, well, anyway, I, I, I don't need to get into all the theories there, but I, a lot of it had to do, I think, with my dad and my parents and how they kind of talked to me about stuff. They're pretty reasonable people um, along those lines, for sure. But I, I wonder, like, I was trying to figure out how do you figure out, like, what is the actual causal connection Mm -hmm. And you kind of alluded to it there at the last part of your statement, mm -hmm. but dig in a little bit more to the causal connection between someone hears, Hey, girls talk too much. And now 20 years later, they marry an abuser. Mm -hmm. What's right. What's the connection there? How do we know that that, that is a real connection there and that it needs to be um, corrected? Yeah. So, okay. Um, this, this might be a little bit complicated because we'll get into survey design, but when we were writing our survey, we looked at a we number like complicated. of, okay. We looked at a number of what, what's called previously validated question sets. And we tried to use as many of those as we could, because when you, for instance, we used a previously validated question set on self-esteem, a self-esteem scale. Um, because then if we're using the same scale that other surveys have used, then our findings um, also relate to all of these other studies. So if they've done how this self-esteem study relates to mental health, you know, we can, we can make broader conclusions. So it's always a good practice when you're writing surveys. And um, the idea that women talk too much or that women's voices are a problem has been used multiple times in, um, as measures of internalized misogyny. So the idea that women, women ourselves think mm. women are not as important as men. And when you combine that with what the church has taught about how women aren't supposed to speak, you really see it played out and internalized misogyny. So the idea that women aren't as important is highly linked to, yeah, marrying abusers, lower self-esteem, um, just not standing up for myself. And you know, that there's, there's, so there's another sense. funny part of it too. Did you, um, the whole thing, because, because, okay, what if girls actually do to talk too much though? Like, what if girls do talk a lot? So, is it even How true? I don't even know. Well, okay, let me tell you the, the science behind it. Um, in 1983, James Dobson made a claim that women speak 25,000 words a day while men only speak 12,000 or something like that. And his point was, ladies, when he comes home from work, he's already said all of his words for the day and you've hardly said any of yours. So, you're going to be tempted to just talk at him and you need to not, you need to give him space. So James Dobson used that to say, women don't talk to your husbands. 
leave them alone. Gary Smalley um, came out with a book where he said 50,000 words versus 25,000. Luann Brizendine said 14,000 versus 7,000. Like the numbers kept changing, but it was always women said double. And so scientists started to look at this and said, where are the citations? There are no citations for any of this. Nobody is citing any study. So then scientists began to do studies. Yeah. And we have meta analyses of this now. And guess what? There is no statistical difference between the number of words that women say a day versus men. <laughs> There's no difference. So they basically just made it up. Yes. <laughs> the only time there's a difference is when you're in a mixed group. So both men and women. And in that case, men say way more than women. The only time women say the appropriate amount based on their percentage in the group is when there's at least 80% female. If it's anything less than 80% female, the men say more than their fair share. So it's not that girls talk too much. It's that we need to give our daughters permission to speak up. That's so crazy. So, so, you know, on, on the, on the subject of surveying, um, I mean, you, you all did a phenomenal, a gargantuan amount of work and research to, to, to get these numbers. And, and, and I think it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, but I'm, I'm curious if, if like, what safeguards did you put into place to make sure that you're not just, you know, like surveying or looking for the answers that you already thought you had, you know, so like the confirmation bias, um, and, and maybe, you know, add, added onto that, um, what, what survey or what what result surprised you the most? Okay, so there's a difference between what we would call frequency stats and what we were actually doing, which was far more odds ratios. Um, so let me explain. A frequency stat would be... Uh, yes, please. <laughs> yeah, okay, so we found one of those. Um, well, let me back up. Sorry, let me back up even more. We, we, have, uh, we did our surveys through Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, so we got ethics approval. Our data sets are up at... Um, nice at the ARDA with Andrew Whitehead. Uh, we're working on several peer reviewed papers. So we're really trying to raise the bar on what counts as research in the Christian community because a lot, so of people, awesome. a lot of people have done research and they yeah. haven't done it to academic standards. So we've really tried to do that. And it just, it just looks crazy and people are, they don't respect it. Anyway, right, exactly. So when you're looking at frequency stats, so um, you want to know how, how often something happens. So for instance, um, we found that 18.7% of women reported being sexually assaulted or abused as teenagers in church. Okay. That's a Jeez. frequency stat. That's how much it happened. Um, we can't guarantee that that is accurate because we didn't have a representative sample. We had a, we had right. a select we had a select sample, right? So our frequency stats, I think they're pretty good because we had so many people. Um, and in our survey of 20,000, we had, oh, I don't know how much I can explain this. We had something called external validation, which is our frequency stats were validated by other studies that found similar frequencies. Gotcha, so yeah. yeah. Um, but what we were really interested in was something where that doesn't matter as much. We were looking at odds ratios. So we were saying, let's take two groups of people people who believed something and people who didn't believe something. And then let's see how that affects something else. So we're going to take girls who did believe the modesty message as teenagers and women who didn't believe it when they were teenagers. And we're going to follow them and see how that affects marital and sexual satisfaction. And so for that, it's not as important to get like a representative sample necessarily, what's really important is to do the stats, right? And that's what that's why we did such high level stats to find out if there's for sure statistically valid correlations, et cetera. Yeah, so, totally. Yeah. Cool. And and the and the and I guess the result, like like did you guys have any findings that that surprised you um, or or that challenged your initial hypothesis going into it? First, she deserves better. I think the really big thing, as I said, was the magnitude like how, how bad the, <laughs> the modesty message was and some of the other messages. Um, for Great Sex Rescue, our surveys for Great Sex Rescue, the, the thing that surprised me, and it really changed the way I talk about sex, was that um, libido is not a problem. We all think libido is the issue, right? We all think if, if, if someone, if some couple has a sex problem, it almost always is that one person wants sex and one person doesn't. And so the problem is we need to figure out how to get the person who doesn't want sex to have more sex. So we need to help them see how great sex is. We need to boost their libido, et cetera, et cetera. What we discovered though, is that libido 
is a symptom. It's not the problem. And I'm going to name five things. Okay. So just get ready. When there's high marital satisfaction, when they feel emotionally close during sex, so she doesn't feel used, when there's no porn use, when there's no sexual dysfunction, and when she frequently orgasms during sex, frequency is not a problem. Libido is not a problem. So if there's a libido problem in the marriage, you need to ask what is actually going on because it's not a libido problem in the vast majority of cases. It's something to do with those five things. It's one of those five things. Yeah. And they are, say them again. So high marital satisfaction. High marital satisfaction. She frequently orgasms during sex. Um, uh, no sexual dysfunction. So no erectile dysfunction, no sexual pain, right, no porn right, use, right. no porn use in the marriage. No use. And they feel emotionally connected during sex. Is that porn use? Like, is that targeting men that the men aren't using porn use? Or both. All both. like both. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Well, I mean, that makes sense. Now, makes now sense. Uh, just, just to clarify, like, so on the porn use issue, um, like, does that include like, I don't know, like Skinamax, you know, like when I was younger, um, you know, like Cinemax, their nighttime programming. Right. Like, they had the two <laughs> different types. Yeah. Very, very. We, no, we only, we only asked pornography we, and we let people define what it was themselves. Oh, interesting. Mm-hmm. Oh. And, and I, I, I only say that kind of with a preface. So um, this would be the first time I've said this in the show, but growing up, like I grew up around porn. My, my dad used to sell porn. Uh, like VHS tapes, um, and uh, it was it was almost like a like a Columbia House thing, like that he used to run. So there was always porn in my household. Okay, you right? can borrow this, and then we can. Oh yeah, it was bad. I used to I used to sell them uh, to my friends in high school. <laughs> my 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 dad's passed long, so he, you know he won't he won't know this. But those uh, were your entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Days. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's yes, so sir. funny. You know, you know, so one of the themes that comes out in your book and books like this is the idea of boundaries, right? Setting them in relationships, stuff like that. Um, so to make sure that you have the kind of, you know, relationship you want to make sure you're not being taken advantage of. Mm-hmm. I assume, I assume this is very important for both. Mm-hmm. partners both sexes in the marriage is it more important for one than the other what how do boundaries help us in a marriage um i think in, in our marriages what are yeah. we talking about there so the, the root of boundaries is understanding that you have value because and and that you you matter your opinions your needs your wants matter because when we live boundaryless lives what we're really saying is everybody else's comfort and preferences matters more than mine and that's not biblical right jesus said love your neighbor as you love yourself like we each have value and yet we have often taught in church that you don't have value or that you should value others so much. So there's that acronym that many people grew up with, JOY, right? Jesus uh, Jesus first, other second, you last. And, um, and, and, and if you, you know, so you're always supposed to put others ahead of yourself. Um, and that can, you can run into a lot of problems in relationships and your self-esteem really falls when you believe that other people's comfort matters more than anything you might be going through. And so helping our kids value themselves and drawing boundaries is, is a really good practice. We tell the story of uh, a youth group experience my oldest daughter and co-author Rebecca Linton back had. So she was about, let's say 15, 16, going to youth group. It was one of those stupid events where you stay overnight at the church. I don't know why. I don't know why people are always doing that, but they were doing the sleepover. And at the sleepover was this 18 year old guy who had been known to to have sexually assaulted several girls at his high school. And he was seriously creepy. And the girls were not comfortable with him being in the church overnight. So Rebecca went to the youth leader and said, this is not okay. And he told her that she was being judgmental and that um, didn't she know that this might be the only way that he would learn about Jesus? And so she needed to not be so judgmental about weird people. Now, it wasn't weird that she was upset about. It was dangerous, but he didn't care. And he felt that she was putting up too many boundaries. So all the other boys in the youth group made it, put it upon themselves 
to do the buddy system with the girls. So the girls were never alone in the church with this guy, but the youth leaders didn't protect them. And these are the kinds of stories we hear about over and over again. Um, wow is girls are told you shouldn't have boundaries because you may be the only Jesus that this person ever sees. And so why would you risk this person not coming to salvation just because you feel awkward or you feel in danger? That's, that's crazy. Yeah. You know, and, and it's, uh, I, again, I'm going to go back to, to my wife. So I wasn't a Christian when I met my wife. Um, I think I told her I was one just because I really liked her. <laughs> um, but, but like, you know, under normal circumstances, she would have never married me. Um, I, I'm not saying she wouldn't have married me if I wasn't a Christian, but like, I just, I mean, like the, the life I lived prior to meeting her was not one that her father would have approved of. I, I'll just say that much, you know, and, uh, but she took a chance and I don't think that she sacrificed, you know, any boundaries or anything like that. She just trusted that God, you know, was, was going to put this person in her life that she would spend the rest of her life with. And, um, up to this point, 15 years later, you know, like it still holds true. So, um, but, but I'm, I'm interested in hearing more about some of these stories, um, that you, you heard from women, um, because I, I can imagine that these stories, you know, had just a powerful effect over, over like your writing, um, and, and just your life and how you kind of think about, you know, the, the contents of, of what your, your book is about. So, so can you maybe, you know, give us another story that, that really impacted you, um, and in, how did that kind of change, you know, the direction that, that you wanted to, to go with, with your book, if it did at all? Yeah. I think that the, the worst things we heard in our focus groups were story upon story upon story about date rape that was never identified as such and that youth pastors really mishandled. So we opened our consent chapter with the story of Vera yeah. who uh, was dating a guy from school who wasn't a Christian. Um, one afternoon he took advantage of her when she had a migraine and she was resting and he raped her. Um, but she didn't have words for what had happened. She didn't understand. She was really confused. She went to her youth pastor and the youth pastor said, well, what did you expect dating a non-Christian? And then the youth pastor's wife, who was only two and a half years older mm. than Vera, which is a whole other story in of itself, um, went and got two pieces of construction paper, right, pink and blue, glued them together. And then when it dried, ripped them apart and showed how there was part of the pink on the blue construction paper, started part of the blue on the pink and, and told her that when you have sex with someone, you create a soul tie so that they are always with you. Um, and this is the danger of having sex before marriage is that you have a soul tie with this boy that needs to be broken and you'll never be able to have real intimacy with your husband because you now have this problem. Um, and this was really common. Nobody checked in with her on whether this had been consensual. And instead we really primed girls not to recognize date rape. So for instance, in Shanti Felton's book, uh, and she was another researcher, um, and she, she wrote for women only for men only. She also wrote a book for teen girls called for young women only. And she asked a question. So I'm about to give you a stat. I do not think this stat is accurate. I think her question was poorly worded. Her possible answer choices were poorly worded and the way she analyzed the answers was poorly done. But, um, her conclusion was 82% of boys feel either little ability or little responsibility to stop in a makeout situation. And so her advice to girls was, if you want to stop it, it is safest to not even start. Now let's be really clear. 100% of boys have the ability to stop in a makeout situation. And 100% of boys have the responsibility to stop if she says no. And so to tell girls that 82% of boys feel either no responsibility or no ability to stop is simply not okay. But this is what happened. And we heard from girl after girl after girl who said, I'd be, you know, I'd be kissing and he would push it. He would put his hand somewhere and I'd tell him no. And three minutes later, he'd do it again. And I'd tell him no. And three minutes later, I'd tell him again and, I'd, and, he, and he'd still do it. And finally, I just stopped saying no. And mm. it, it wasn't that they wanted it. It was just that they gave up saying no because their no meant nothing. And they were told that this meant that, you know, that they had lost their purity, that they had, that they had made a choice. 
And then a lot of these women ended up marrying the guy because they were told they were married in God's eyes. Wow. Uh, that stinks. That sucks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, as I'm hearing, sitting here and hearing you talk and, and so many emotions and thoughts are going through my head. I have two daughters. Um, and of course I have a son and two daughters. I remember what it was like to be a young Christian boy struggling with everything. I remember what it was, um, you know, I don't know what it was like to grow up as a teenage girl. I'm going to have to, um, and I'm trying to figure it out. You know, that's why this book is very interesting. They're young now. My, mm -hmm. my, my, uh, oldest daughter is six. So it's now though, to start having these kinds of conversations or these, you know, and age appropriate ways, which of course, figuring that out is interesting. I'm sure that there's resources, but you know, I, it, it's so eye opening, like thinking about her. Cause I grew up in a family of four boys and one girl. So men outnumbered the women in my family. We were crazy. You know, the boys were all nuts. My mom, even in some ways, because of how much she just, you know, she understood, she had this view growing up um, that uh, like when I was growing up, like, hey, it's so funny because she would say, listen, if you get caught in a situation where like if you're 18, say, and something happens and there's a 15 year old girl, you're the one going to jail. They, they said that to me all the time. They, <laughs> and whether or not that was true, whether or not the statistics bear that out, I don't know. But I had this fear, dude, like <laughs> I will never get someone pregnant. <laughs> it took us a while to get pregnant in my own marriage, I think, because of my own issues. I will never get someone pregnant <laughs> because I'm just not doing that. Um, and then the second thing, though, was like you're, you are going to be the one that's the bad guy. You're going to be the one that's like um that everyone's gonna blame it's interesting to hear this because what i'm hearing from you is such an opposite message that mm -hmm. so many girls received and i don't know why i received the one i received i think my mom was just worried she didn't want her son to go to jail for doing something mm -hmm. and she really wanted to you know all of her boys to feel that and understand that and of course she wanted us to treat women with respect and and she t and both my parents talked about that, and we and, and and we do when we strive to do that. One of the things I keep wondering about, and and just wrestling with, like for instance, the idea of the two, like ripping the two things apart. Like I could see what where it was going as you were talking about that, <laughs> and I'm like, what is the consequence? I guess my question is, what is the consequence? What should the right messaging be? And I and I and, and and I'm sure that you get to these kinds of things. I know that this is part of what you're trying to do is bring awareness and bring the right messaging. She deserves better. And I agree, my daughters deserve better. So what is the right messaging? What is what do we tell our kids about sex? Because of course sex is very powerful. Yep. And we don't okay. want them messing around with it. But what do we do? Yeah, to, or, or yeah. yeah, help me out here. As a dad who's got two girls mm -hmm. that are going to be coming into this, what, 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 help me out with the messaging part of all this. Okay, well, first of all, in the book, we do have a lot of conversation starters and ways that you can have those conversations. So please, first of all, get She Deserves Better. It will help you walk through that with your kids. A couple of things to know. Information, there is no downside. There is no downside to giving your kids information. We had a very strange generation in the church with the millennials, because if you look at our survey of 7,000 women, Gen X's and boomer women had more sex ed at the point where they graduated high school than millennial women did who grew up in the church. Because in the 90s, basically Christian circles stopped giving any sex ed and all they did was say abstinence, don't do it. Very, very, very bad things happen when you have sex. So um, we gave we gave survey takers 10 possible sex ed questions. We said, how many of these d could you define at the point where you graduated high school? The more words you knew, the better you did long term. Like there is no downside to knowing more words. Interestingly, mm. women were more likely to know the words for male anatomy than they were for female anatomy. So 
That's we're funny. not teaching women about our own bodies. Um, when women feel ashamed of their periods, where they when the puberty ha- conversation isn't handled really well, and women feel like I have to keep all of this secret, their self esteem goes way down, and that has disastrous effects on marrying abusers, etc. So you really want your kids to know about their bodies. You want them to know about sex. You want them to know as many words as possible. Um, you want them to understand consent. All of those things make girls less likely to have multiple sexual partners, more likely to have high self-esteem, less likely to engage in risky sexual behavior. Like there is absolutely no downside. So I don't know why we stopped giving people education because that was a really bad idea. (laughs) Because the less education they have, the more likely they are to be taken advantage of, the more likely they are to be abused in church, the less information they have. At any any age? mm -hmm. Like six-year-old? Yeah, like we... Well, age appropriate, age appropriate, but it's so important for kids like six years old to know the names for their anatomy because they have to be able to tell you if something's happening, like just basic things. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, if you have toddlers, read Don't Let the Pigeon Drive the Bus. Have you ever seen those books? The Pigeon series? Oh, yeah. Big fan. They're awesome for teaching (laughs) consent. Just go get it. Don't let the pigeon drive the bus. But anyway, um, so yeah, so so just information's good. Then we measured a whole bunch of messaging around sex before marriage. And what we found is that when you give kids threatening messages, that has negative outcomes. When you give them aspirational messages, that does not. That has good outcomes. So telling kids sex is something sacred that is meant for marriage, that doesn't have bad outcomes. Telling kids if you have sex before marriage, you will never have the intimacy that God wants for you once you are married that has negative outcomes. Um, right. So let's, let's not threaten kids. You can tell kids like, oh, did you ever see the movie Mean Girls? You know, the, do you know the movie yes. Mean Girls? Okay, there's this really, it's a meme now. One of my the, faves. Yeah, you know, the gym teacher who's giving the sex ed talk, and he says, like, don't have sex, or you will get pregnant, and you will die. Right? Like that, yes. basically, <laughs> that is the message that yes. we gave during purity culture. Our, our books told girls, there's 13 steps to putting on a condom. Condoms don't work. Um, that's not true. Condoms, even with 13 even with, steps. I don't I'm even know what they it. are. Like, I know I tried to figure it out. Like, is one <laughs> getting in the really car to go to the drugstore? 13 steps. <laughs> yeah, like I don't even know what they are. But but there's no downside to telling kids, hey, condoms are actually really effective at present, preventing STDs and, and pregnancy. They're not perfect, yeah. but they're pretty effective. That's, that's okay to tell kids that because the problem is if you tell kids birth control doesn't work, you will get pregnant, you will get an STD, you will be rendered infertile, you might die. Our kids are all going to have friends who are having sex and who aren't dead, you know, and, and when they realize that and they're going to think we lied to them. And so our reasons for not having sex can't be because all of these terrible things will happen to you. Yes. Tell them about pregnancy. We also lied to them that they were going to have great sex. Yes, that's another issue is that we bribed them. We bribed kids. And that we uh, yeah. That leads to a lot of deconstruction too. And and (laughs) that's a big problem. (laughs) But you can just tell kids, hey, you know what? You're gonna want to have sex. Because that's you were made like that. You were made with, with hormones, you were made to be sexually attracted to people. And when you're with someone that you really love, you're probably gonna want to have sex. That's not wise for you at your age. It's too important. It can really mess up your feelings, you know, and, and I want, I want you to save this for marriage and here's why. And you can tell them all your own personal reasons and what you think. Um, but it's very important for you to decide what your boundaries are and then make a plan to stick to those boundaries. And even more important than that, honor the boundaries of the person you're with. And if someone isn't honoring your boundaries, that's a red flag. That relationship isn't safe. And I think those are the yeah, kinds sure. of messages we need to give. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious, like the, the origins of this type of, um, I don't know, theology, philosophy, whatever, um, you know, that that's causing young girls to, to think this way. I mean, like, is it, is it just like, you know, parenting or, you know, is this something that's just kind of unique in the, in the church? Um, you know, cause again, like I, like I said, I didn't grow up in the church. So a lot of the concepts and whatnot 
posed in your book are, were all pretty foreign to me. And I was like, I don't mm -hmm. know, you know, like this sounds like a Christian problem, you know? Um, but, but I'm curious, like why, why, Indeed. why did we get to the point where we had to say she deserved better? Purity culture came out of a really bad time in the eighties. So in the eighties, teen pregnancy rates were through the roof. Um, you know, rates of, of sexual behavior was through the roof. Alcohol, drug use was through the roof. And everybody was looking at this. Governments were looking at this. Churches were looking at this. And everyone's freaking out. And we're like, how can we get these teenagers under control? And so governments put in comprehensive sex ed. The church freaked out at that. And the church decided to clamp down on everything. And so for the first time we had dating wasn't allowed. Dating was considered unchristian. You had to court. Um, uh, you weren't allowed to kiss before the wedding. And when, when you look at our, at our results over generations, Gen X and boomers, we all dated. We all were allowed to date. This was not a thing, not being allowed to date. But suddenly right. among millennials, you had a whole generation where many of them were not allowed to date. And you start seeing people saving the, the first kiss for the wedding, which was never done before. You know, even like 200 years ago, people kissed at the engagement. Like it just, it, like the thought that purity culture is returning to a bygone era. No, this has never been done before. This was a new thing. Um, and it, it was... It was trying to control teenagers by preventing any possible opportunity for them to mess up. So we're not going to let kids date. We're not going to let kids touch each other. We're going to separate the genders as much as possible. Um, we're going to tell them to get married super early. Yeah. Uh, we're going to tell girls that you are super dangerous to boys. And so you're going to cover up and boys can't help it. And so we've got to make sure that, that boys aren't tempted because everything is just a powder keg ready to explode. And what we never did was teach kids how to be emotionally healthy and that their emotions matter and that their bodies, there's nothing wrong with their bodies. It's like, we just tried to control things. We put a lot of shame on it. And certainly there was a lot of these messages in the wider culture too. Um, but the church itself did, did a lot of damage in those era, in those years. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious if, if you think, you know, a lot of the, the purity culture stuff is what caused, um, you know, famous, you know, preachers like Ravi Zacharias or the Hillsong guy, Joel Houston, host, host, something like that. Um, if, if it's sort of like purity culture meets Me Too movement, um, and, and what are your thoughts on that? I think it's purity culture meets male entitlement because so much of our teaching has been men can't help it. This is how God made men. God made men to lust. God made men to have this insatiable sex drive. God made men to have sexual needs and women are here to, to, um, to fulfill those needs. And when you combine those two things, it's really quite toxic here. Let me give you an example. Um, there was a curriculum marketed to girls ages eight to 12 called secret keeper girl. It's now rebranded to true girl, but it's pretty much the same today. Um, it, it was an event that happened all across North America. Several hundred thousand girls went to this thing and they had this test for modesty called the raise and praise test. So you were supposed to put your arms up in the air. And if your belly showed, it meant that you weren't being modest. And the reason was because bellies are intoxicating. And then the author, Dana Gresh, had this conversation moms were supposed to have with their daughters to explain this. So you were supposed to say, do you remember what intoxicating means? It means that you get out of control, like when you're drunk. And God created our bodies to intoxicate men. But you're only supposed to intoxicate one man, your future husband. So we need to cover up to make mm. sure that you don't intoxicate other men. Okay, let's dissect that. Because what she is saying is that an eight-year-old, an eight-year-old's belly has the ability to make an adult man out of control. That's horrible. It's horrifying. How did nobody say yeah, anything? Yeah, that's horrifying. That is horrifying. You know, I just want to live in a church. What a, what a horrifying place for, what, for a little girl to live. I know. And imagine what, what's going to happen when she's 11 and someone gropes her. She's going to think, what was I wearing? You know, I just want to be in a church where mm. if an adult man says that a 12-year-old is dressed to be a stumbling block, that instead of handing the 12-year-old a sweater, we freak out on the adult man. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Call the police. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That's, Man, that's... that's so, so I'm kind of, I mean, I'm trying to kind of get my thoughts even about me because so many things are running through my mind, um, you know, partly because I experienced this growing up. 
partly because it feels like my home life experience was such that almost like um i don't know i want i want to be careful how i say it but in my home life was such that it's almost like i didn't quite get the like like feel the weight of what you're bringing here mm-hmm. like again like i said like i felt like what well, it would be my fault mm-hmm. like essentially if anything went wrong i'm the one getting blamed i'm the one getting screwed <laughs> you know for lack of a better term yeah. i'm the one that things are not you know are going to be and in it so so many things are are like just running through my head um as i'm as a process well here can i can i try to add something to that yeah, please yeah i please. think what we did find in both of our surveys is that evangelical women have artificially lowered libidos like we have lower libidos than the secular world we want sex mm. less and we don't enjoy sex as much and we have more sexual pain and I believe a lot of that goes back to the messaging that has been given specifically to women and to girls. And a lot of guys don't see it because it's in, it's in our media. It's, it's on the, it's from the Instagram followers that girls follow. It's from Brio magazine that was marketed to girls from focus on the family. You know, it's from these books that were given to girls. It's from when they, when they divide up the boys and the girls, like it's girls that are given the modesty talks. Boys aren't told all this stuff about mod. It's girls who are told this. And when we tell girls all of these messages, it leads to really negative outcomes for women. And I think a lot of men are married to women and who, you know, these women might want to want sex more, but they just don't, they just don't like it that much. It's never been that enjoyable. And you're like, I don't know what to do. And it could be that the answer is that a lot of these messages that she internalized as a kid and as a teenager have just made men seem gross sex seem gross and my body seem dangerous. Sure. And how are you supposed to enjoy sure. sex if your body is dangerous and men are gross? You can't. <laughs> yeah. And so like, we need to undo this messaging. And I think yeah. like my plea for men is just to understand the weight of what was put on women, even if you never heard it, because you weren't the target audience yes. for a lot of this stuff. Right? Yes. That's very good. Yes. And it helps me realize and other men like me, I hope I'm not the only one. Um, it <laughs> makes not. me realize <laughs> that like, um, just because something isn't immediately apparent to me, or if I hear it, you know, I'm skeptical. I'm like, whoa, really? Mm-hmm. That doesn't have anything to do with whether or not it's true. Yeah. And I think that's something that like has been really hard for a lot of people. Because I, well, I grew up in this church, I would have seen that. Yeah, I would have experienced that, or that would have been like how and like getting out of out of our own experience and trying to enter into the experience of someone else. Because you're absolutely right, dude. I didn't read any of that crap. I I did. I didn't get any mm-hmm. of it. I didn't get stuff for boys. I didn't read the crap they. I didn't know. I had no care about. It. I didn't want to read it. I'm sure my parents wanted me to read it. I had no interest in reading it. Give me something else. I didn't like any of that stuff until I got to college and I became a theolo, started studying theology. Then I started caring about the Bible, um, which isn't uh, everyone, but that was just me. But like, what? So I guess here, here's the thing that's like keeps just keep, I keep it keeps coming back to me, and the messaging I hear, like that that changing that messaging is so important. Um, how how big of a deal? How much of a big deal is sex? Like, what I mean is, like, have we made it just way too big of a deal oh, in yeah. the evangelical <laughs> community? Like, Jesus hardly talks about it. Yep. Did you see- I'm trying it, to think of some lines, like, very real, just adultery. Yeah. And don't look, but that they talked about that all the freaking time. Yeah. We never learned about the other more important teachings of Jesus. Everything was about how to keep your member in your pants yep. for boys. I- I don't know if uh, everyone's watching on YouTube versus listening on a podcast, but in chat in, on page 40 of she deserves better. We have some word clouds and one, this side, this side is what's in the new Testament. And this side is what is in books for girls. And in the new Testament, it's all about like Jesus, Jesus love, pray, wow. believe, faith, glory, peace, kingdom of God, Holy Spirit. And in books for girls, it's love, sex, weight, husband, virginity, temp, virginity. Purity. <laughs> it's like it's virginity all about- has to be in there like three or four times. 
Yeah. And you know, when I went to, when I was in youth group in the eighties in Canada, so this is before American purity culture came in. Our main focus in youth group was like evangelism. Let's tell your testimony. Let's pray for missions in the world. Let's figure out how to change our high schools for Christ. And my daughter's experience in youth group 25 years later was totally different because for them, it was all purity, purity, purity. And so something really changed. And when you look at our survey results, the millennial generation are the most likely to have believed all the toxic stuff as teenagers. Like they're more likely to have believed it than Gen X and boomers, but they're also the least likely to believe it today. So millennials believed it as teens and have largely left it behind. Gen X and boomers didn't necessarily believe it as much, but they're more likely to believe it now because we didn't experience the harm in the same way. And so a lot of us are still passing it along because we don't realize how harmful it was. But the, for the millennials, it was really harmful because it, 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 it made their faith only about their hymens and not about your heart and what it really means to follow Christ. Um, oh, preach. That should be your next sermon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's, that's crazy. I, yeah. So, um, I'm curious, like you've done a lot of podcast interviews, um, kind of promoting the book and, and what have you. And I, I, I was debating whether or not to ask you at the top of the interview or not, but, but, uh, uh I, I definitely want to ask you now is, do you find that the types of questions that you get from men interviewing you are different? than the types of questions that you get from women. Cause I'd imagine like, like you, you were on um, a, a friend's podcast, Lori, Lori Brown. And, mm-hmm. and, and, uh, and, you know, I, I know that she herself has gone through some stuff within the church. So like mm-hmm. her, the, the way that she would come into an interview would probably be informed by her own life experiences and what have you. And, you know, just like Josh and myself and Josh has shared some of the stories of, of him growing up in the church and the things that he was exposed to. Um, like, do you find that the questions are different? I, I think, I think a lot of men are still trying to figure this out because they didn't experience it. Right. And, and for them, a lot of it seems, um, self-evident. I mean, don't guys have a harder time stopping? Don't we need to warn girls about guys have a harder time stopping? Like how, how can you say Mm -hmm. that we shouldn't say that? Um, and so I've had to explain the harm a lot more, (laughs) I think with some of the men, I think with women, it's interesting the things that have really resonated with a lot of women, because I've ended up talking about a lot of the boundary stuff with women, which I wasn't expecting. I thought that we, that most people would want to talk about the modesty and consent stuff, but some of the bigger picture things about you don't matter. You don't have a voice. Um, sticking up for yourself is wrong. That's, that's the root of a lot of women's pain. Um, and even trying to figure that out as an adult. And so I've gotten into some interesting conversations with that about women, because I think that's more foundational is, uh, is yeah, how, how, how can we have healthy relationships if I'm not allowed to matter? And if, if thinking about what I want is somehow unchristian. Um, so we just need a, so much of, of a more robust understanding of what it means to be a follower of Christ. Yeah. And what it means to die to self, because the idea of dying to self, I, I think we have made it into being nothing. And that's not what Jesus meant. He just meant be focused on the kingdom, mm-hmm. make the kingdom. And, and you know what? We're part of the kingdom. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, We're made in the image of God. Yeah. And, and a Jesus has a special calling on each of our lives. And that means that we have to matter. Mm. Huh. I want to I want to give you um, just one. One more quick question, and then 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 we'll we'll wrap up. And this is kind of like your your opportunity your opportunity to preach. Um, if you are a you know teenage girl listening to this, having read your book, um, and you have not you know given your life to Jesus yet, um, but you're you're listening to this and you're reading, you're like, why the heck would I want to give my life to Jesus at this stage of my life? knowing that like, like all this stuff is going on and I, I don't want to necessarily go into the church and become an activist, you know, and try to reform the teaching and what have you. Maybe I'll just wait until, you know, I'm in my twenties or something like that. Um, so like what, what message would you have for, for that girl? Is that Jesus isn't a set of beliefs. Jesus is a person and there's nothing like going through life 
with someone who honestly loves you and who is there. Um, and that's why we, we, we need to follow Christ is not because, yeah, we want to be an activist or we want, we, we feel like we have to do all these things. It's just that life isn't worth living alone. <laughs> it, it's too hard. Um, and the, the real source of, of joy and self-esteem is knowing there's a creator who values you and that you do have purpose. That's what I would say to girls. I think my message to parents would be a little bit different. Um, the good news that I would want parents to really understand is that church attendance is a good thing. Believing in Jesus is a good thing. Long-term people who go to church, better marriages, better self-esteem, better mental health. Yay us. Like it's, it's good, good, good. But there's a huge but. And that's that when girls internalize these toxic teachings, the benefits of church disappear. And many girls would have been better off if they hadn't gone to church at all. If you look at their future marital, marital outcomes and self-esteem outcomes. Mm. And we don't want that for our daughters. And so as parents, we need to make sure that our church is not hurting our kids. Because a lot of churches have. So get involved in youth group. Find out what they're teaching. Um, talk to your youth leaders. Because it may not be that they're deliberately doing anything bad. They just may not know any different. So give them a copy of She Deserves Better. Like, let's start having these, these conversations. Because the church can change. It really can. And church is good. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we can't keep doing this. Because we hurt a lot of people during purity yeah. culture. And it needs to stop. Yeah. So, so what's, um, I guess what's next for you and your, your work in this area? Oh, we keep being asked if we're going to do a, he deserves better. I mean, I would, I would love to, um, but we're under contract. We're writing a marriage book right now. So our next thing, we're, we have two big projects. So we're doing a big, huge project on sexual pain in, in, um, with some, a bunch of pelvic floor physiotherapists to get to the bottom of religious <laughs> affiliation or religious association with sexual pain. And then we're doing a huge marriage book. Um, trying to create healthy marriages from the ground up. So I don't know, maybe we'll eventually get to that too. But yeah, we're just trying, we're just trying to get more research into the Christian world so that we can judge by fruit. That's awesome. And, yeah. and where, 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 uh, where can people find out more about you, your book and, and everything else you're doing? Yeah. So I'm at baremarriage.com, B-A-R-E, baremarriage.com. And my books, Great Sex Rescue, She Deserves Better. If you click on books, they're right there. Um, we have courses to talk to your kids about puberty and sex. And of course, we have our Bear Marriage podcast every Thursday. So you can come check that out. That's really awesome. Well, so thank good. yeah, thank you so much, Sheila, for uh, spending some time with us. And um, yeah, good luck to to all the wonderful work you're doing. And I, this wasn't as uncomfortable of a conversation as I thought it was. <laughs> good. Like, maybe, maybe I need to read more books that's, about that's sex. That's so funny, dude. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thank you again. And Just thank embrace you to, it, dude. Embrace it. <laughs> yes, I will. Uh, well, thank you to our Faithful Politics listeners and viewers. And uh, we will uh, talk to you next week. Goodbye. Oh, wait, hold on. Let me stop.